Hello, everybody, and welcome to our uh, Newlands lecture today. Uh, my name is Dr. Simon Gerrard. I'm a senior teaching fellow and the undergraduate admissions tutor in the department. I'm also outreach coordinator and working with our education office manager, Raj Sandhu. We'd like to uh, welcome you on behalf of the Department of Chemistry and the RSC. Um, so this is our Newlands lecture series. It's fantastic to see uh, so many people registered and are slowly joining us uh, for the talk today. Uh, the Newlands lecture series started in 2013 and we're really pleased to continue hosting this lecture series this year after a break last year. Um, before we start, just a bit of further information for you. Um, this Microsoft Teams live event will be run like a webinar. Um, you can use the live Q&A function, which is the column on the right hand side of your screen to ask us questions. And they could be about the talk itself. They could be about studying chemistry at university, about Professor Tom Welton or his research. Um, you can give your name or you can post anonymously as well. And we will reply on camera in the Q&A session at the end. You can also like questions too. So uh, that gives us a, an idea on which ones to focus on first. I'd now like to hand over to our head of department, head of the chemistry department, Professor Oscar Sess, to introduce our speaker today. Many thanks, Simon. So, hi folks, great to see everyone today. Uh, my name is Professor Oscar Says. I'm, as I mentioned, the head of the chemistry department at Imperial College London. And I'd like to bring you a really warm welcome to this year's Newton lecture, which is going to be delivered shortly by Professor Walton, who's currently president of the Royal Society of Chemistry. So before introducing you to and handing you over to Tom, I just want to tell you a little bit about this lecture series and where it came from, you know, based in honour of John Alexander Rayner Newlands. So he was born in Lambeth, not a million miles away from where I am now here in London. And he was educated at the Royal College of Chemistry, which is actually the forerunner to Imperial College London itself. He's best known, and some of you, you, some of you folks might know that, for devising a really early form of the periodic table of elements. So back in the middle of the 19th century, when lots of elements were coming to the fore and had been discovered and characterised, chemists were starting to put together attempts to sort them into logical patterns of behaviour based on their chemical properties. And back in 1864, he listed the known elements at the time in order of increasing atomic mass, and he found there were repeating patterns and properties for each eighth element. And he developed a rudimentary form of periodicity, which was back then called the law of octanes. And it went quite a long way towards establishing this idea of periodicity. It didn't quite work in its entirety because it failed when it got to heavy elements, but other contemporaries at the time, in particular Mendeleev, built upon these principles and eventually you know, we came to know the periodic table as it is today, but he was a real kind of pioneer in those early days. And this lecture series honours the, the, this work. It's been organised by ourselves, the Department of Chemistry, in collaboration with our outreach team, the Royal Society of Chemistry, the Children's Middlesex section. And I want to give special thanks to Steve Robinson, Simon Gerrard and Raj for all the hard work in organising today. Now, a bit more about our presenter today. So, Professor Tom Welton, he got his degree in chemistry in 1985 and his PhD in 1990 from the University of Sussex. At that point, he began his research career at Imperial College London in 1993 as a Lloyds of London tertiary fellow. He then became a lecturer in 1995. And in 2004, he actually became the world's first professor of sustainable chemistry at Imperial College London. As the years went on, he became even more established. He became the head of the department in 2007, and it ultimately became Dean, which is one of the biggest positions at Imperial College London in 2019. His research interests are focused on ionic liquids and their use, application and recycling, enabling chemical processes to remain more environmentally and economically sustainable. Now, you know, a, a, alongside science, you know, Tom is a real champion for equality, diversity, and inclusivity. And in 2017, he was actually awarded an OBE for services to diversity in education. And most recently, he was actually in 2020 elected as president of the Royal Society of Chemistry, which he still is at the moment. So in today's lecture, Tom's going to demonstrate the huge role that chemistry and chemists play in enabling the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And this presentation is a look at ways that chemistry can help us maintain healthy lifestyles on a healthy planet. Tom, over to you. Thank you very much, Oscar. And, you know, coincidentally, today I am going to be um, talking to you from uh, Lambeth. So there's a there's a real connection there between this talk today and Newlands himself. Now, I need somebody to tell me that they can see uh, the PowerPoint presentation, so I know you can. It's all loaded up now there, Tom. 
Perfect. Right. So I shall begin. I say I'm going to talk to you today about chemistry and sustainability. And, and and really to look at the, you know, what chemistry has to offer to sustainability and a little bit about how that is being delivered. And the story really starts with uh, this woman here. Her name is Gro Brundtland. Um, and she was a Norwegian politician who was asked by the UN to develop its World Commission on Environment and Development, which published a report called Our Common Future in 1987. And in that report, which of course was more than a sentence long, um, she came up with this idea of sustainable development, which is development that meets the needs of the present generation, us, without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. And also in this report, she said something which is really important, often much more overlooked, which was in order to achieve sustainable development, we need a collaboration between governments, industry, and something she called the civil society. And that just means us operating as people. We are the civil society. And I'm going to look a bit at that today. So sustainable chemistry is then really quite easy to, to define because it's the implementation of that concept of sustainability in the production and use of chemicals. How can we make the way that we make chemicals, the way we use them, the way we recycle them, more sustainable. But importantly, there's this really big and, which is how can chemistry be applied to enable sustainable development to occur? And I'll look at both of those today. But Niels Bohr, well, over 100 years ago, pointed out really the, the difficulty with this uh, this definition, which is how do we know what the needs of future generations are going to be when he said prediction is very difficult, especially if it's about the future. And so let me give you an example. So here's a photograph that was taken in uh, St. Mark's Square in the Vatican City in 2005. Here is a photograph taken at almost exactly the same place in 2013 and it doesn't take much to see the difference between 2005 this dark sea of people to the bright lights of their phone screens in 2013. Now so what are those screens made of what makes those screens be able to function and here, here are all the elements that you can find in a smartphone. There's nearly 40 of them in all sorts of different operations. But today I'm going to be focusing on these three. So this is indium, tin and oxygen, which together make indium tin oxide. And indium tin oxide is the thing that enables the swipey screen of your phone to operate because it's transparent. So it can be a screen, but it's conducting, it conducts electricity, and that's what allows you to use it as a touch screen. And so without indium tin oxide, we would not be able to use our smartphones in the way that we do today. And that's the big difference between 2005 and 2013. Now, here's a periodic table which perhaps looks a little bit unusual to you. But it was produced by the European Chemical Society um, back in 2019, the International Year of the Periodic Table. And what it represents is the amount of the different elements that are present here in the Earth's crust. And it's a logarithmic scale. So twice as big means 10 times as much. Otherwise, you just see some great big oxygen and then you wouldn't have room to see anything else. And the colour coding is if it's green, well, there's just plentiful supply of that element. If it's yellow, 
then there might be some limited availability, there might be some risk to future supply, given how we use it. If it's amber, there's a rising threat from increased use. And if it's red, then that element is a serious threat of depletion in the next 100 years. So sort of in your lifetimes. And now, what do we see for indium and tin? So tin is itself yellow. There is some risk, even though it's a more moderate risk. But indium is under serious threat. And the truth is, you know, if we go back to, say, the beginning of the of the century, no one really cared about indium. It had some specialist uses. It was maybe of interest to a few inorganic chemists like me, but it really wasn't something that anybody thought important. And yet by 2013, it was central to how our mobile phones worked. You know, and I am sure if I asked you to take out your smartphone now and to drop it on the floor wherever you are and stamp on it, you'd be hesitant to do so. So Indium has gone from being something nobody cared about to being something which is central to how we live our lives and in fact is under serious threat. So its use as we currently have it is unsustainable. And it just gives you the example of how quickly things can change. You know, 2005, 2013, eight years, something can go from being, ah, that's fine, to under serious threat. So it's very difficult to predict what future generations are going to need when we can't even predict for ourselves 10 years in advance. So this is really now how we um, treat sustainable development. And these are the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And they're much more a kind of, here are things that are important for a sustainable society that you might choose to try and improve. So number one, no po poverty, reducing poverty. Number two, zero hunger, reducing hunger and so on and, and so forth. Some of them are very technical, like affordable and clean energy. Others are much more societal, like um, reduced inequalities, gender inequality, and some sit in between like quality education. And so by working on these different themes, we can improve sustainability. So now I would say sustainable chemistry is the application of chemistry and chemical products to achieve the sustainable development goals. But while we're doing this, we need to use less stuff. And by that, I mean to consume nature's resources at a rate that is lower than that at which they can be replenished. And we have to make less waste. We have to produce waste at a rate which is less than that at which it can be naturally remediated. If we can manage all of these things together, then we will be able to generate a sustainable society. So I'm going to look uh, first of all at this one of the sustainable development goals, zero hunger. And so um, ammonium based fertilizers really came to the fore in the last century and between 30 and 50 percent, depending on how you count it and who's counting. They account for, as I say, up to 50 percent of increased crop yield that was generated in the 20th century. And approximately 40% of the world's population's food needs are supported by that increased um, crop yield. So ammonia fertilizers are really, really vital for achieving that zero hunger outcome. So how's ammonia made? Now what you'll see in the top left hand corner is a little A star. Um, whenever you see that, it means the thing that I'm talking about is directly related to uh, the current A-level syllabus. And so for those of you who are thinking about your exams, um, you might want to be taking notes at this stage. <laughs> OK, so ammonia is made by the Haber-Bosch process, which was um, invented in 1908. And the picture on the right hand side is actually the first Haber-Bosch reactor. 
So it was taken out of the chemical plant at the end of, of its use and is put up in a square just outside the BASF factory um, where um, the Haberbosch process was first um, invented. As you will know, it requires high temperatures and high pressures. The equilibrium needs to be forced over to the right hand side and that requires high pressure and high temperature. Consequently, because also it's such a massively produced chemical, it accounts for between one and 2% of world energy demand. And that equates to about 420 million tonnes of CO2 every year. But also, you see here, it uses 5% of the world's methane. Well, that's odd. When I look at this equation, nitrogen and hydrogen becoming ammonia, I don't see any methane in there. So why does it use so much of the world's methane? And here's the reason, and that's because this is how hydrogen is produced. So hydrogen is produced by a thing called steam reforming of methane. So you heat the methane under pressure with steam and that gives you carbon monoxide and hydrogen. And then further to that, um, the carbon monoxide can react with more water, more steam to give carbon dioxide and more hydrogen. Again, it requires high temperature and pressure and has this very, very large energy demand because you can see that first reaction is strongly endothermic, whilst the, the second one is only mildly exothermic. So we really do need to put energy into this system in order to generate the hydrogen. So lots of people say, ah, right, OK, well, let's think of a better way of making hydrogen then. And we can think of clean hydrogen production by the electrolysis of water. So you take water and you produce oxygen and hydrogen in an electrolytic cell. Great, we do that, no methane, no CO2, surely this is a sustainable hydrogen production. But you do have to be very, very careful and think about where does this power come from? And if you're talking about the same electricity uh, mix um, as you get from the grid, that will include coal, gas, nuclear and renewables. And so this electrolysis isn't necessarily quite as clean as you think it's going to be. What some people are, are doing and attempting to do is actually to be able to use photolysis, so solar energy, to produce the energy necessarily for the electrolysis directly in the electrolytic reaction. But that's a matter of research at the moment, but would be sustainable hydrogen production if we can get there. Then you can take your, I've put a little sun symbol, you can take your um, photolytically produced hydrogen, react that with nitrogen and again, in uh, an electrochemical cell, perhaps using green energy sources to make your ammonia. And then we would have a much cleaner, much greener, much more sustainable ammonia production, which we then use um, as fertilizer to enable zero hunger. And so you see that, you see the interaction between the chemistry, the development of new chemistry and the achieving of the development goal. Now I want to look at um, this one, goal number 12, which is responsible consumption and production. And I will talk about production in this, I'll talk about recycling in this, but I will also talk about consumption, things that you can do. And I'm going to focus on the issue of plastics. Um, in the last few years, people have become much, much more aware, aware of the problems that plastics cause in the environment. And, you know, and you can see just here are some pictures that I downloaded off the, the Internet of plastics being everywhere and causing damage to wildlife. 
And when I say they're everywhere, I really do mean they're everywhere. And so in the map on the left hand side here, you can see I've got a marker for a tiny little dot of an island that you can't even see on the map. It's so small and it's called Henderson Island. And it's just about as far away from any major centre of human habitation as you can possibly get in the middle of the South Pacific. Yet the photographs that you can see on the right hand side are photographs of the beaches of Henderson Island. Where in 2017 nearly 38 million items weighing nearly 18 tonnes of plastic were found on Henderson Island's beaches. So plastics really are everywhere. And why are they everywhere? Well, they're, they're everywhere because they're everywhere. We use them everywhere. And so here what I have is a diagram that's showing you the fate of all of the plastic that has ever been made. So we've got, that is 8,000, 300 million metric tons of plastic have been made. And of that, 2,500 million metric tons are still in use. And so that's one of the things we have to think about plastics. You know, I'm, I'm sitting in my kitchen here in Lambeth, you know, and there are items of plastic in this room that are over 30 years old. We want plastics to be durable and to make things that are going to last. Unfortunately, if you see the blue loop at the, the at the bottom, for plastics that are no longer in use, only 600 million metric tonnes have ever been recycled. And only 100 million metric tonnes have ever been recycled twice. The vast majority has gone to being discarded in landfill nearly 5,000 million metric tonnes have gone to landfill or other forms of waste and hence end up in places like Henderson Island. And if you look on the right hand side at the graph, you can see just how worrying the projections are for future waste from plastics. Massive escalation over the next 20 or 30 years. And again, why is that true? Well, uh, plastics are everywhere. We use them for everything. And you see on the right hand side here, you know, lots of examples for packaging, uh, but things like chairs and pens and bottles and toys and all, all sorts of different things we use plastics for. And on the uh, left hand side here, so this is this is a pie chart which shows you all of the petrochemical production that comes out of an oil refinery that is not fuel. So most of what comes out of an oil refinery is used as fuel and it's burnt in our cars and etc. But this is the other stuff that comes out of an oil refinery and you can see pretty much 80% of the mass of material that comes out of a petrochemical refinery is plastic. So we use masses and masses of plastics. And this is all where the problem starts. We use it a lot, we use plastics a lot. We use plastics in a way that we think of as, of course we do, plastics are cheap, disposable. We throw them away, use them once. And so both how they're made, how much is made and how we um, treat them when we have them all lead to these problems of plastics being everywhere. So what can you do about it? What can you as, as individuals do about it? And, and here we have um, uh, what I'm calling the five R's. Do you know what? The first thing you can do is you can just refuse it. You can just say, I am not going to use that thing. And here's an example, a particular bet noir of mine are plastic balloons, usually filled with helium, another precious resource, and we let them go to float off anywhere. And you can see here a picture of one that's been caught in a tree. Yeah. There is no need for this in our lives. There are plenty of other ways in which we can celebrate events 
we can just refuse and say, no, I am not going to buy a balloon. We can reduce. And now here's something some manufacturers have done for us. And and so one of the things which is uh, been a a real um, a change over the last 20 years as we go around our supermarkets is the introduction of more concentrated brands. And so this bottle um, is uh, twice as concentrated as its predecessor, which was more concentrated than that. And, and of course, the thing that's been taken out is not so much the active ingredients, it's water. And so vast amounts of water were inside the original um, bottles of washing liquid in this case. And that water is no longer there. That means that actually less mass is moved around in the backs of vans, reducing the environmental impact of the transport. Less plastic because it's a smaller bottle, so reducing the amount of plastic. And so overall, this is a way that our manufacturers have been helping us to be able to make the choices to have more concentrated brands produce less plastic. And here on the on the right hand side, you know, the, the manufacturers actually told us how much less plastic by rather than buying the bottle here of liquid hand soap again, you can buy a refill and by buying the refill, you end up having 75 percent less plastic than you did in the original bottle and so if you bought uh, an original bottle again so we can reduce the amount of plastic that we're using. We can of course reuse and again this has become um, very much more common and so rather than you know buying a bottle of water and every time you want a bottle of water and throwing the bottle away you can have a reusable bottle. It doesn't have to be anything as swish as these. You know, you can literally reuse the bottle that you bought the water in the first time or using a reusable um, bag instead of a single use carrier bag. We can reuse and every time we re reuse, we reduce our impact on the environment. The other thing that we can do is we can recycle and what I've got uh, for you here are the plastic resin identification codes they're called and each of those numbers you'll be familiar with seeing them on the sides of plastic products each one of them represents a different type of plastic and um, all of these can be reused uh, sorry these can be recycled sometimes we can, um, we'll be asked to recycle them separately. And so there are times when you'll see the these numbers really matter and you have to think, oh, I need to put, you know, all the ones together, all the fours together, etc. Very often, as we, we'll, we'll see in a minute, in a minute, they are called commingled, where they're all just mixed together. But if you see this sim, one of these symbols on the side of a plastic um, product, that means it can be recycled and of course you should recycle it. So we're going to talk about um, number one, which is a plastic called polyethylene terephthalate or more often just called PET. And it's particularly easy to recycle PET products and PET is very often recycled. Most drinks bottles are made from PET and they can be recycled as they have been here into making a plastic bag, but I've seen PET is also, um, when you hear of the word polyester, when you're talking about clothing, so polyester clothing or cotton polyester clothing, that polyester is PET. And so I've seen products where um, things like sweatshirts are made from recycled water bottles. And so PET can be recycled very easily and you can see here the chemical structure of it and so you have the terephthalate part um, which is the uh, benzene ring um, and the uh, the esters um, coming off it and then of course the ester part hence polyester when it's called polyester and the ethene interve inter intervening between um, uh, the two esters and the reputation um, to give you the polymer. So 
as I say, very often um, uh, we find the plastics commingled and, and even within a, a single product. So here's a, a water bottle and indeed the bottle is made from PET, but the cap of this water bottle is made from polypropylene. So a different plastic. And so you get a separation problem immediately when starting to think about how do we recycle these plastics. Now you can, of course, in many instances, separate them manually. You know, you can have like this people at a conveyor belt and they will physically separate different materials by site. But that's not really um, uh, the best way of doing it. And um, you might be able to do it when you have a large object like a, a milk carton, you can see at the front here, but it's much more difficult when your plastics are um, in smaller particles or even shredded. I should say you can find out more about the recycling of plastic bottles at this RSC um, website that you see down the bottom here. So that's edu.rsc.org feature um, slash feature slash recycling plastic bottles and you'll you'll find it there. You'll find a whole um, uh, world of um, information about plastics in general um, on the RSC website. But you'll be familiar with most of you, the electromagnetic spectrum. And so you have, you know, low frequency radio waves, microwaves through to high frequency X-rays and gamma rays. In the, not quite in the middle there, you have the visible spectrum, uh, the light that we see, and just a slightly lower frequency than the light that we see, there's infrared. And infrared uh, is a really useful form of radiation in separating plastics. And that's because of this. So this is, uh, or these are infrared spectra of a number of different plastics. So that's, um, you know, your PET that you've just seen, high density polyethylene, low density polyethylene, polystyrene and PVC are all represented here. And very luckily, I guess, um, they have quite distinct absorptions in the infrared. And so that means that if you shine infrared light on them, you can, uh, separate, you can distinguish the different types of plastic depending on whether they absorb particular uh, frequencies of infrared radiation. And then you have a scanner which, um, which will recognise the different types of plastic. And literally you have an array of air nozzles underneath your conveyor belt and when it sees um, PET, one of the one of the air no nozzles will blow. When it's seeing PVC, a different air nozzle will blow and then it separates the plastics from each other and then the sorted plastics can be taken for recycling. A rather more simple but really effective technique that's used um, for some of the gross separations and particularly the separation of PET is this in water baths and you can try this at home. So, you know, take a water bottle and, uh, you know, cut it up um, and uh, then cut up the lid so you've got them separated and, but, but um, you know, so that you can put them in a glass. And what you'll rec recognise here is that the pet is more dense than water and so will settle on the bottom of the glass Whereas your cap, which is likely to be something like high density polyethylene or polypropylene, will float on the top of the water. You know, and I, I recommend that you give that a try and see for yourself. And then these um, vats of water are then used to separate uh, PET from other plastics so that it can be recycled. Very straightforward, simple mechanical technology um, without all of the bells and whistles of infrared spectroscopy. There is one last thing that tends to be done with, with PET and that's be because PET is very often used in applications that are food based, you know, for things like things like bottles. Um, you have to be particularly careful about uh, the cleanliness of the final plastic that you're going to recycle. 
And so what's generally done is something called a chemical peel. So you're doing a reaction just on the very, very surface level of the plastic, not trying to react all of it, but just like I say, the very surface. And so you end up taking off a very, very thin layer of the outer layer of the polymer. And so effectively, it's a cleaning process for the plastic particle. And you can do this um, by hydrolysis. And so, um, as I said, PET is an, is an ester and esters can react with water in a hydrolysis reaction. And that hydrolysis reaction can be catalyzed either by strong base, sodium hydroxide is the example I've got here, or by strong acid. Sulfuric acid is the example that I've got below. And in those, you make sodium terephthalate and ethylene glycol, or you make terephthalic acid, sodium sulfate and ethylene glycol. And then those small molecules are washed away. They're, they're soluble in water, so they get washed away, revealing nice, clean PET underneath. But actually, those technologies are being investigated as a way of what's called chem cycling of uh, PET. And we do a little bit of this in my own research lab. And so the idea of chem cycling is usually plastics recycling is a mechanical process. You separate the, uh, the various different plastics, you get the PET, and then you got lots and lots and lots of PET chips, which you melt down and then you reform PET fibres, for instance, out of that melt. But it leads to a, a degradation of the polymer. And so your recycled uh, polymer isn't quite of the same quality as your original pristine polymer. And that can lead to a limited amount of recycling you can do. Um, people try and deal with it in all sorts of ways by mixing in fresh um, polymer in with the recycled polymer to try and give um, the overall quality. But the idea of chem cycling is you say, well, forget all of that. What we're going to try and do is we're going to try and take our polymer back to monomeric starting materials from which we can make that polymer. And so you do a chem cycling and you can do that through hydrolysis. So the same kinds of reactions that I've just shown you for the chemical peel. You can do that through um, uh, hydrolysis to make the terephthalic acid and then use that as your monomer. More often, people are interested in actually making other kinds of esters in a reaction called a transesterification. So you take your ester, the PET, and you react it with, react it with methanol in a reaction which would be called a methanolysis. It's a thing called a transesterification. And then you make the methyl ester of your terephthalic acid and liberate the um, ethylene glycol, which you can also recycle to use to make the monomer. Or actually, you can do a thing called a glycolysis. So you take uh, the ethylene glycol as your alcohol, in large excess, you react it with the PET, you make the glycol ester and use that as the starting material for making your PET. And so these are being very intensively researched at the moment as methods for chem cycling of PET. And so finally, in, in this of the five R's, um, I, you know, responsible disposal. If you can't refuse, reduce, reuse or recycle, then it is important that disposal is responsible. And, you know, uh, here's a picture from a city street where I think that's clearly not been the case. Or a photograph here of, uh, um, this is in Northern Ireland, uh, uh, this project where, um, Groups of people um, will go out to beaches and actively clean them, go and pick up the rubbish, remove the plastics and other rubbish from the beaches in order to try and minimise the damage 
on the beach. So responsible disposal is really, really, really important when you can't do the other things. So, you know, all of this is part of an idea of, you know, how do we develop a science for sustainable plastics? And here is another RSC report. You get this on the main RSC website, www.rsc.org. And if you just put in progressive plastics, you'll find it. Or actually, if you just Google RSC sustainable plastics, you'll find the report. And, you know, we've identified four major research challenges for being able to develop a sustainable plastics future. And one of those is, of course, we do have to understand the impacts of plastics throughout their life cycle. So through production, use, recycling, how we use it and eventual disposal. We do need to close that loop for plastics recycling, so we're not throwing away things that can be recycled. And we need to develop new plastics, new sustainable plastics, in order to replace the less sustainable plastics that we have now. And as part of that, we need to understand and be able to control plastic degradation. So those are the four major challenges for a sustainable plastics future. And here's a, an example that I'd like to I'd like to give you. So this is agricultural mulch film and agricultural mulch film. You know, it has many advantages. So you can see sheets of it here in a field and it provides a physical barrier that means that you can reduce the amount of pesticides that you use, reduce the amount of herbicides you use, reduce the chemical load on the ground. But unfortunately, traditionally, that mulch film has been made from polyethylene, which is persistent, non-degradable, and actually degrades the soil quality itself as it breaks down into the soil and so we need to replace that with biodegradable plastics. Which brings me finally to this, the idea of biodegradable plastics. And so I think many people, when they are thinking about the word biodegradable, they sort of imagine, you know, if I take this piece of plastic and I, you know, drop it on the on the on the street or in a field, that if it's called biodegradable, that will just degrade in the soil. Unfortunately, that's rarely the case. Most often when we say something is a biodegradable plastic, what we mean is it's a compostable black plastic. That means that we can put it in an industrial composter and it will degrade. We might with some of them be able to put them in a domestic composter and it will degrade. But it certainly does not mean you can chuck this thing out of the car window and forget about it. So in our replacement, we need to think about a whole range of different possibilities. So we do at the moment rely very heavily on conventional plastics, which are fossil fuel based and do not degrade. We can make many plastics from renewable resources. But just because something's made from a renewable resource does not mean that it will necessarily biodegrade. We can have biodegradable fossil based. We can have non biodegradable fossil based. We can have non biodegradable re, um, from renewable resources and we can have biodegradable for renewable resources. It, but it's very easy to think, oh, what we need is renewable resources to give us biodegradable but actually go back to that very first thing that I said, I have things in here that are 30 years old and are plastic. Many, many plastics, we do not want to biodegrade. We want them to be resilient and to last and last a long time. But those, of course, we want to be of plastics which can be very easily recycled. So for the uses where we don't want degradability, we want efficient recyclability, good recyclability. And for the uses where actually degradability is better, then we want biodegradable. And that's a, you know, a complex area of modern research. And that's kind of where we are now. And you know, by the time that you come through and you're starting to think about some of the research that you might want to do, then 
this will be the challenge that faces you. 